Important notes about online learning. On the course page, you will find a very useful document with some hints and tips on how to manage your data and to reduce your data consumption. Download the slides and go through them along with the video or audio, and please pay special attention to the lecture outcomes. The outcomes tell you what you need to be able to do in order to pass the assessment. This means that the outcomes define the scope of your assessment. You still need to make notes and try to express things in your own words, and this is going to be very important for your own understanding. You still need to go over the prescribed reading and do the exercises, and you need to explore further through additional reading or online investigation. For instance, YouTube has some wonderful linguistic resources. Remember that your evidence of engagement will all be part of your portfolio. Every lecturer hopes that all students do these things anyway, but when you're doing online learning from home, the opportunities to do so are quite different. It becomes even more important that you do these things. You will need to manage your own time and take responsibility for your own learning. All right, enjoy the lecture. You may notice that these are not the dulcet and sonorous tones of Mark DeForce. I'm Andy Harrison, your tutor, and I'm going to take this lecture about evidence for structure in terms of binding. Let's go through the outcomes together. Ultimately, we want to be able to show that meanings interact with structure. So by the end of this lecture, you should be able to identify anaphores, pronouns, and R expressions, to identify the structural relation, C command, to be able to define, exemplify, and explain principles A, B, and C, to apply a theoretical construct like C command or principles A, B, and C to explicate structure, to provide evidence for structure based on binding, to explain or argue the nature of the structure based on this evidence, and the structure is hierarchical. And finally, we want you to be able to apply pedal to constructing syntactic argumentation. So how does this fit into what we're doing this term? We're exploring formal characteristics of language and specifically looking at evidence for hierarchical structure. So we're focusing on how do we know that there is structure. We've done this through looking at constituency and hierarchy and C command. And we've explored hierarchy and C command through polarity items, minimality and movement, and now today, binding and reference. The first thing to note is that words refer to things. So this is pretty obvious. Um, and we know that noun phrases refer to an entity in the world. And this extract is from a BBC article about Alice Cober, the woman who played a radical role in decoding Linear B. So it says, in the 1930s and 40s, Cober was an assistant professor at Brooklyn College in New York, where she taught Latin and Greek classes all day. For almost two decades, Alice Cober devoted herself to trying to crack this mysterious Bronze Age script. She turned herself into the world's leading expert on Linear B, says Fox. It was she who was working hundreds of hours with the slide rule sitting at her dining room table a cigarette burning at her elbow, poring over the few published inscriptions, looking and looking for patterns. In the search for clues, Koba learned a whole host of languages, from Egyptian to Akkadian to Sumerian and Sanskrit. So with the colours, I've tried to draw your attention to three different types of noun phrases. So the first one in blue are noun phrases that refer to entities in the world, like Brooklyn College or Alice Koba, or Sanskrit. In red are pronouns like she, other examples would be he, him, her, I, me, you, they, them. And in green we have herself, another example of a noun phrase like that would be himself, themselves, each other, and these are called anaphores. So we're going to look at those in more details, but firstly a puzzle. So why can you say he saw himself in the mirror, but not himself saw he in the mirror or himself saw him in the mirror? Why can you say he saw himself in the mirror and you can say he saw him in the mirror where him is referring to a different entity? So, for example, John saw James in the mirror, but not he saw him in the mirror where he and him refer to the same entity, like John saw John in the mirror. And I just want to draw your attention to the little letters at the bottom of the noun phrases. These are called indexes, and the index shows whether or not the words refer to the same referent. So if words like 
he and him are marked both with the same little letter, they have the same referent, they refer to the same entity. If the words have a different index, they refer to different entities in the world or different referents. So going back to those three types of noun phrases we identified in the paragraph, the first one was called R expressions, and the R stands for referring. So R expressions are noun phrases that get their meaning by referring to an entity in the world. Examples of these include Mark, Linear B Tablet, or Marshmallows. Next we have anaphores, and these are noun phrases that get meaning from another noun phrase in the sentence. So for example, herself, themselves, or each other, or himself. In their example, we have Alice Koba turned herself into a world expert on linear B. Herself refers to Alice Koba, and the NP Alice Koba is giving meaning to herself. So you can see I've indexed them, they refer to the same entity, and herself is therefore the anaphore. A quick note, antecedent is a noun phrase that gives meaning to another noun phrase, and in this case, Alice Koba is the antecedent because it's giving meaning to herself, the anaphore. In the second example, the children told themselves not to be frightened. Themselves refers to the children, their co-index, which means they have the same referent, and the children is acting as the antecedent, and themselves is the anaphore. In the final example, Tandy and Jeremy liked each other. Tandy and Jeremy is the antecedent. Each other refers back to Tandy and Jeremy, the noun phrase, and so it is the anaphore. The last type of noun phrase that we looked at in the paragraph were pronouns. And these are noun phrases that may get their meaning from another noun phrase in the sentence, but may not. For example, I, me, you, he, him, she, her, they, them. For example, one can say she loves Nadia, where she could be someone like Maria, um, and she stands in for Maria, but Maria is not mentioned in the sentence. So in this case, the noun phrase does not get its meaning from another noun phrase in the sentence. Um, because she loves Nadia, it's talking about two different entities. In the second example is similar, Jack enjoys talking to them. Them is a pronoun, it doesn't get its meaning from an entity in the sentence, but you know it's referring to something else outside of the sentence, right? In the example, the boys told us that they had eaten all of the rusks. This is an ambiguous sentence where they could refer back to the boys, so the boys told us that they had eaten all of the rusks, they had done it. And or the boys could be telling us that they, an unnamed group of strangers, had eaten all of the rusks. So in this case, the noun phrase could get its meaning from the boys, or it could be referring to a different entity outside of the sentence. The last example is the same. Kelsey thinks that she is cool. Kelsey could be thinking that she herself is cool. Um, and so the noun phrase in that case could be referring back to the noun phrase earlier in the sentence. Or Kelsey could think that Maria is cool. And so it refers to another noun phrase that is not in the sentence. And this brings us to binding theory. So binding theory determines whether a pronoun or anaphore is correct in a particular setting. That is, it determines when an anaphore must be used instead of a pronoun or an R expression. So the definition of binding is dependent on C command. So we say the definition of binding is A binds B if and only if A and B are co-indexed. And remember, we said that co-indexing was two noun phrases that have the same index. That is, they refer to the same entity. For example, Enzo smiled at himself in the mirror. Himself and Enzo are co-indexed because they refer to the same entity. The second condition for binding is C command. So A must C command B. And let's test this with the same sentence we had. Enzo smiled at himself in the mirror. The requirements for binding, the first one is co-indexing. Are Enzo and himself co-indexed? Do they refer to the same entity? Yes, they do. So we can tick off that requirement. Does Enzo C command himself? C command, as we remember, you look at the node that we're looking at. So Enzo, the noun phrase, you go up one node, 
down another one, and everything underneath. So yes, we can say that Enzo does see command himself. And this means that Enzo binds himself. Himself is bound by Enzo because we've required, we fulfilled the two requirements for binding. Okay. The binding domain. So this is a phrase that is brought up often in binding and it's really important that you understand what binding domain is. So binding domain is the smallest sentence containing the noun phrase in question. So if we're looking at he, what is the smallest sentence that contains the noun phrase in question? Um, and that would be, he was a good soccer player, right? So we can see that this is an embedded sentence within a bigger matrix clause, and that is he, the binding domain of he, right? If we look at another noun phrase, Tulani, the smallest sentence containing the noun phrase is this entire tree diagram. That's the smallest sentence containing the noun phrase Tulani. So that is the binding domain of Tulani. So binding domains will differ depending on the type of sentence or what you're looking for, but it's a really important thing to understand, right? So let's go back to our puzzle. We said, why can you say he saw himself in the mirror, but not himself saw he in the mirror? And why can you say he saw himself in the mirror, and you can say he saw him in the mirror, but not he saw him in the mirror when him and he refer to the same entity? In a similar vein, why can you say he liked Josh, where he refers to someone else, like Enzo, Enzo likes Josh? And you can say Josh likes Josh if you're talking about two different Joshes. But you can't say he like Josh, where he and Josh are the same entity, or Josh like Josh, when it's the same Josh, or himself like Josh. These puzzles will be resolved when we talk about the principles of binding. And so ultimately what we've come to realize is that binding dictates the behavior of anaphores, pronouns, and R expressions. And it does this through the use of three principles. So the first one is principle A, which is about anaphores. And principle A states that an anaphore must be bound within its binding domain. So to recap, binding happens when two entities are co-indexed. So A um, is co-indexed with B, which means they refer to the same entity, and A C commands B. Right. So in the first example, Jamie said that himself was happy. We're going to find the anaphore, which is himself. And its binding domain is the smallest sentence that includes the NP in question, which is himself. And that is, himself was happy. Right. So now we can see that the problem arises because himself is co-indexed with Jamie, which is its antecedent. But Jamie is not within its binding domain. Therefore, it's co-indexed, but it's not in the same binding domain, and it violates principle A. The next example says Elena believed that Enzo liked himself. Himself is the anaphore, its binding domain, the smaller sentence that um, includes the NP himself, is Enzo liked himself. And you can see we don't have any problems here because the anaphore is co indexed with Enzo. It is C commanded by Enzo, and they are all within the same binding domain. So it's bound, check, and it's in the binding domain. So that fulfills all the stipulations of principle A. The last example is Elena thought that Enzo disliked herself. We can hear this is ungrammatical. And the reason for this is that the binding domain that includes herself, oh, sorry, that's about Enzo. Um, the binding domain that includes herself is Enzo disliked herself. Herself is not bound by its antecedent within the binding domain. Herself refers to Elena, and Elena does not bind herself in its binding domain. Right. Principle B is about pronouns. Principle B states that a pronoun must be free within its binding domain. And when we say free, we just mean it must not be bound within its binding domain. So for the example, Enzo dislikes him, 
where him is a different entity to Enzo, so Enzo dislikes James. This is totally fine. The binding domain is the whole sentence, but him refers to uh, an entity outside of the binding domain, outside of the sentence, and so is free. So it obeys principle B. In the second example, Enzo dislikes him. Same sentence, but him and Enzo are co-indexed. They refer to the same entity. It's the same binding domain, the smaller sentence that includes the pronoun in this case. And him and co is co-indexed with Enzo, which means that it is not free. Enzo C commands him and also co-indexes it, so he is bound. Him is bound within this binding domain. Nadia said that she was excited. Um, the pronoun is she. Its binding domain is she was excited. And this pronoun is not bound within its binding domain. There's no um, entity that refers to the same person that is in this binding domain. And it's for this reason that Nadia can be the same entity that she is. So she can refer to Nadia. So Nadia says that she, Nadia, was excited. Or Nadia can say that Maria was excited. And either ways, it doesn't matter because the pronoun is free within its binding domain. Okay, Nadia told Tandi that she loved her. She is the pronoun. She loved her is the binding domain. And again, well, we've got two pronouns here, actually. We've got she and her. She refers to Nadia and her refers to Tandi. And so you can see that neither of the pronouns in question are bound within their binding domain. So they refer to entities within the same sentence, but not in the same binding domain. And that is why this sentence is grammatical. The same sentence, Nadia told Tandi that she loved her, is ungrammatical when she and her refer to the same entity. So in this case, she loved her as the binding domain. She and her both refer to Nadia. So the pronoun her is not free within its binding domain. And this is because she and her are co-indexed. She, C commands her. And so her is bound, which violates principle B. The last principle is principle C, which is about R expressions. And this principle states that R expressions must be free, so they cannot be bound. In the first sentence, she kissed Elena. This is ungrammatical because she and Elena are co-indexed, which means they refer to the same entity. Um, Elena and she are the same person. She C commands Elena, therefore she binds Elena. And Elena, as the R expression, is not free in the sentence, right? So that's why it's not grammatical. Tulani's picture of Tulani is nice. So if we said Tulani's picture of himself is nice, no problem. The R expression Tulani is free. But the minute you have a second Tulani um, referring to the same person, we have a problem. And this is because the first Tulani, C commands the second Tulani, and they're both co-indexed. So the second Tulani is bound and therefore not free and therefore violating principle C. For she met Enzo, We've got two totally separate entities. We have she, an unnamed woman, and Enzo. Enzo is the R expression in this sentence, and Enzo is not bound by anything in this sentence. So that is grammatical. The last example is he met Enzo, where he and Enzo refer to the same person. The trouble here is that they're co-indexed. He, C commands Enzo. And we know that our expressions cannot be bound. So that is why it is ungrammatical. Okay, guys, those are the three principles of binding, which brings us to our summary of the lecture. And these are the things I want you to remember from this lecture. Binding theory determines whether a pronoun or anaphor is correct in a particular setting. Right. Then binding domains are the smallest S node containing the NP in question. 
A binds B if and only if A and B are co-indexed and A, C commands B. And principles A, B, and C dictate the behavior of anaphores, pronouns, and R expressions, respectively. And ultimately, at the end of the day, all of this comes back to C command and evidence for hierarchy in language structure. So binding is a really, really important part of language structure and thinking through relations in language. So um, ultimately, it all comes back to evidence for hierarchy. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I'm looking forward to looking at this with you in the tut. And I hope you have a lovely week. Thank you so much.